Good morning, everybody. Good morning. How y'all doing? Good. Good. I like Good. to hear that. Good on you. <laughs> I like to hear that. I wanted to not only welcome you all, but uh, remind you of just some of the scriptures that uh, describe why we are putting such a strong emphasis on scripture. And I think, and I would hope, that that's one of the things that you guys notice uh, about this church is that there's a very strong emphasis on scripture. And that is the way that uh, all Reformed churches should be. Um, a strong emphasis on Scripture, on Scripture being the authority. Um, I was asked multiple times at the food pantry yesterday, what is a Reformed church? And you might have that same question. If you wanted a really quick and concise way of answering that, I would say it's historic Christianity. It's historic Christianity. It's going back to the church of the book of Acts the very beginning, authority uh, authority through God's scripture alone, a belief in God's sovereignty, and a recognition of God's grace, and that without God's grace, we wouldn't be able to be saved. So if anybody asks you what's a Reformed church, that's the quickest, easiest answer. It is historical Christianity. It's going back to the way the church was from the very beginning, a focus on God's sovereignty, the inerrancy and sufficiency of scripture and scripture being the authority of the church and then also the fact that we are aware of and reliant upon God's grace those those are the major points of a reformed church and the idea is is that when the reformation happened over 500 years ago it was a calling back to God's church to come back to the historical orthodox christianity and so that's needed just as much today, maybe more today than it was needed even 500 years ago uh, when Martin Luther and Tyndale and Calvin and Zwingli, all these great uh, leaders stepped forward to reform the church. So I just thought that you'd be interested in hearing that. It's another way of, of putting it. Um, it's also Matthew 4.4, 4, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Or Romans 15, 4, whatever was written in the former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of scriptures we might have hope. So there's a big reason why we focus so much on scripture here. It's because it's how we hear from God. It's how we know what he wants. It's how we know what to do. It's how we know him. And so we must make sure that this is God's church and for it to be his church we need to hear from him. And the way we hear from him is through his word. Yeah, so hopefully that helps you. I'm always refining that answer, and I, so far I think that's the best answer, the shortest, most concise. Um, it's kind of nice to have a quick one that's like an elevator answer, because, you know, well, give me three minutes and I can explain to you what the Reformation is and what a Reformed Church is. So you don't always have that. So this is better answer for those short, quick, concise. I get a lot of those questions all the time, so I'm thinking that you guys will probably run into them too. Let's uh, open in prayer. Father, thank you for being you. Thank you for all your grace, your mercy. Thank you that you have drawn these people here to hear your word. I pray that you'll bless them all, that you'll help them to walk in your truth. Lord, that you will form Christ in each and every one of them that you'll help meet every one of their needs perfectly in and through Christ Jesus, and that today, Lord, that our worship to you will be pleasing, and that you'll use your word in this time together of fellowship to edify us, to build us up, and to help us build up one another. We put this church and everyone here in it in your mighty hands, and we thank you we can do that in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll do a reading for today. Today's reading ties into what we're going to be studying in Romans 12 today. And the reading today is Romans 6, verse 13, which says this, Do not present the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness. This is speaking to believers. Do not present the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death until life, from spiritual death to spiritual life, and present the parts of your body to him as instruments of righteousness. 
That's what we should be yearning to be. Instruments of righteousness. Right? It should, your sin should bother you. You should be yearning for that day when you will finally be glorified and be able to perfectly worship God and no longer sin against Him, even in the smallest of ways, even in your thoughts, your, your motives. To, you should be yearning for that. So we should yearn as believers to have our bodies and our minds and our actions and our deeds, our thoughts, everything be towards righteousness and not wickedness. That's what we should be stirring each other up to. That's what Hebrews 10, 24 and 25 says, right? Do not neglect meeting together, as is the habit of some, but be there to encourage another and stir one another up to good works. That doesn't mean going and painting your neighbor's fence. Good works means righteous works, righteousness, righteous living. That's what I want all of us to always be encouraging one another to do. When somebody says, oh, I'm going through this right now, encourage them with God's word to be heading towards righteousness. What's the, which way would the world go and which way would God's word tell you to go? Right? They're going to be two different ways. So we should always be encouraging one another and stirring up one another to be righteous, to pursue holiness. To live for God and not ourselves. So we should encourage one another to live for God and not ourselves. Let's remember that today as we worship and as we get into the message later. Before we get in today's word, uh, let's pray. Father, once again we come to you together in this little fellowship of believers who are seeking after you, who want to know you and your will and the way to do that is through your word, your all-sufficient, inerrant, perfect word, breathed out by you, protected and kept by you, and brought to us through the ages by you. Today, Lord, we ask that this text, this scripture that we're so grateful for, that you will illuminate our minds, that you'll give us wisdom and understanding, that what we see and read and understand from your text today by the help of your Holy Spirit, that you'll help us to enact it in our lives, not just once or twice, but that you will make it a pattern for our lives and that you'll help us to be able to do this every day, seeking after you and living for you instead of ourselves. We're so grateful for you and your word today. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. So Romans 12, I, before we get into this, I want to remind you of something that we read at the end of Romans 11, because it runs right into Romans 12. So this is the end of Romans 11, verses 33 through 36, which says, this is Paul. He's kind of, he's kind of um, worshiping God and just talking about how amazing this is. He says, oh, the depths of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments, how unscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him, from God, and through him, through God, and to him, to God, are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Everything is for God's glory. Everything. It's for God's glory. We are so unworthy of Him. The more we recognize who God is, the more we recognize how unworthy of Him we are. The more truths we read about God and His holiness and His righteousness, the more our sinfulness is exposed. And the more it should humble us and make us so grateful for His grace and mercy. There is not one day that we have worshipped Him or praised Him or lived for Him like we should. None of us. No matter how mature you are in His Word, no matter how far along you are in the sanctification process, there's not one day that we have worshipped Him or lived for Him or thought for Him or praised Him in the way that we should. And alas, we cannot. Not yet. Because remember, we went from being in bondage to sin to being freed from that bondage thanks to Jesus Christ. And now you're no longer in bondage to sin, but now the spirit and the flesh are at war with one another. 
And as long as, as the spirit and the flesh are at war with one another, we will not be able to worship God and praise Him and live for Him perfectly as we should, as He deserves. But one day, we will. One day, this battle between flesh and spirit will be over, and you will be glorified as believers in heaven. And that battle will finally be over. One day you'll be set free from the sinful flesh for good. God will finish what he has begun in all those whom he calls to be his followers, his children. One day you will be complete and totally sanctified. To be sanctified, remember, is to be made holy. One day God promises that he will, in Philippians 1.6, finish the good work that he began in you. He will form Christ in each and every one of his children. One day that work will be complete. One day you'll be completely glorified. And then you will finally be able to worship and live for God in perfection and peace. So if everything is for God's glory, shouldn't we live like it? If everything that we have for all eternity as believers, all these promises that we've been reading about and hearing about, all these assurances. Remember, all throughout the book of Romans so far, we've been hearing about the beautiful, wonderful, undeserved assurances that believers have. But we've also been hearing about, boy, if you don't have any of those assurances, you should fear. You should be in, in fear, right, if you're an unbeliever. But if we have all these wonderful promises and all these wonderful assurances that we've been reading and studying together throughout the book of Romans, should we not live our lives in such a way that it reflects our knowledge of just how wonderful these assurances are? If someone gives you a mighty gift, aren't you going to reciprocate as best as possible your gratefulness for that gift? And who has given a more mighty gift, a mightier gift than God? His very own Son, and He's lavished all this love and mercy and grace upon us whom He has called out of darkness and into light. So I ask, are you living like this? Are you living as if everything is for the glory of God? We have to shake each other awake sometimes. When I was talking earlier about how it's our job as fellow church members, as brothers and sisters in Christ, to stir each other up to good works, to righteousness. You can also think of it as shaking each other awake, right? This world will delude you. It will fool you, trick you, get you to forget what you're really here for, who you're really here for. So we need to shake each other awake and say, am I living, am I living for God's glory or am I living for myself? And to do that with one another too. If we see one another strain or if we have that loving concern, we need to do that. If you're not living that way, if you're a believer, it should bother you that you're not. This should be, if, if you're a believer and you know you're not living this way, this message will prick you. It will, it will make you uncomfortable and you'll make you say, you know, I know I should be doing that way. It bothers me that I don't. Just like how sin should bother you. If you know that you're not doing that, this should bother you. And if it doesn't, there's a problem. It should bother you. I've heard many people through personal encounters and through the phone call ministry, and they always talk about how they have a difficulty living the Christian life. They'll say they're not pleased with their life or how they know God isn't pleased. They'll mention how they've tried this, they've tried that. Many people today, even many true Christians, head to various seminars and conferences or look to the latest books that say three steps to do this, ten ways to get that, all in search of a personal benefit. When they do that, they're looking for a personal benefit, a practical, emotional, or spiritual benefit that they hope to receive. They have tried to get everything from God that they can, but yet they still feel empty, lost, miserable, like they're failing at the Christian life. They're not satisfied. They're miserable, so they think, 
I need more. The problem is I just haven't found the right thing yet. Or the problem is I just need more of what I've already been doing. But what they are doing, what, when, what somebody's doing when they're doing that is just the opposite of what we're going to read in Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. It's the exact opposite of what you should be doing. It's the exact opposite. Please hear me. Please listen. The key to a productive and satisfying Christian life is not getting more from God, but giving all to God. That's the secret. That's what you need to be doing. You don't need more seminars. You don't need more self-help books. You don't need more five-step programs. You don't need to be getting more from God. You need to be giving more to God. You need to be giving not just more to God, but all to God. Jesus said in John 4, 23, that true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For such people, the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God gave himself to us, not because we're so awesome and great. Get over yourself. You wretched sinner. I'm a wretched sinner. God did not give himself up to me to make me happy. God did not give himself up for me because I'm so awesome. Far from it. God gave himself up to me so that I would give myself up to him. If everything's for his glory, then even my life is for his glory. What shows that in my life? Is my life showing that? That I'm living for His glory, not my pleasure, not my happiness, not my joy, not my vision, not my dreams. I've given those all up. When I have died to Christ, when I make Him my Lord, He's my Lord. I'm His slave. There is no such thing as a slave without a Lord, and there's no such thing as a Lord without a slave. If He's my master, then I live for His command, for His will. So the key to living out the Christian life is not trying to get all we can from God. He's going to give, everything that he gives us is solid in Scripture. So the key to living out the Christian life is not trying to get all we can from God, but giving all that we are and have to him. Many, many people, even professing Christians, only, only professing Christians could even do this. Many people aren't trying this. Many people aren't doing this. The first 11 chapters of Romans tells us of the assurances and the grace given to us by God. And now, starting in chapter 12, we see what God commands us to give in return. So Romans 1 through Romans 11, all throughout there is assurances and warnings, right? But mostly assurances that are telling you this is what God is giving you as a believer. But then we get to Romans 12, and there's a change, a marked change. All of a sudden, now it's, this is what God expects of you. There's also some of that throughout the first 11 chapters, but this is a major change, where now this is what God commands of you. This is what God requires of you. In many of your Bibles, right before Romans 12 begins, it will say in a little subtopic, it will say, a living sacrifice. That is what God requires of you. In three simple words. A living sacrifice. Is it fair that Christ came, lived, and died as a sacrifice for you, and you get to live your best life now without having to sacrifice anything when your Lord and Savior sacrificed everything? No, no. Scripture tells us that we're not here to be pleasured. We're not here to find our joy and our happiness in this life. We're living for the life to come, and we're living for the Savior who bought us. It's not fair that he bled and died on the cross and we're to expect to not have to suffer one iota? That he should sacrifice everything and we should say, well, that's fine for you, Lord, maker of all, one who chose to die in a tree that you yourself created. That's okay for you, but for me, I want an easy life. I want it nice and simple. Comfy chairs all the way. So listen to Romans 12, verse 1. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers. He's speaking to believers. Remember, he just got done with that great exhortation of God. 
Oh, how marvelous and unsearchable are your ways. To you be glory forever. So then he says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. You might say in a moment of high emotion, God, I love you. I'm just so grateful for all you've done for me. I would do anything for you. Great, God would say. Romans 12, verse 1. Boom, this is what I want. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. That's how you worship Him. Not just in singing a song, not just in giving money, not just in doing nice things for other people. True worship includes many things. If I was to ask you what true worship is, no doubt I would hear things like prayer, praise, thanksgiving. No doubt I would hear that true worship is also serving God by serving others in his name, especially fellow believers. And doing good and sharing. All that's, all that's true. All those are good things. But above all else, our supreme act of worship is to offer ourselves holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, holy and completely and continually to the Lord as a living sacrifice. In other words, I strive to make my every day lived for Him and His glory instead of for myself. For those in Christ, those who believe that God is God, if you believe that, then the only acceptable worship is to give yourself completely to God. Right? If God came down and He was here right now and He said, I will make it so that my presence doesn't just immediately, my glory won't just burn you up. If I made it possible to be in your presence right now and He came down and He was standing right here, and he said, what will you give me as a sacrifice? Would anybody go up to him and give him anything less than your all? Would you dare walk up to him and say, I will give you approximately 33% of my life, Lord. If he was standing right here, would you dare to say that? No, of course not. We don't think this way because the culture doesn't think this way. Which is why we need to be together and in God's word to stir each other up, wake each other up. Wait a minute, wait a minute, I'm not living the way I should. If God is God and God has welcomed me into his presence, he's died for me, he sent his only son to die for me, to be resurrected for me, he's called me into his family, he's adopted me as a believer, and I'm going to give him less than 100%? I doubt anybody here would do that. So if you wouldn't do it in that situation, why in the world are you doing it now? We should strive for that. We should strive for that. And we shouldn't accept anything less than that. After 11 chapters of learning all you enjoy because of God's grace and mercy and love, His forgiveness, His salvation, His sanctification, His glorification, it should be clear that we owe Him everything. Everything. It's kind of the, the wake-up call that this life's not about you. It's not. The, the universe doesn't revolve around you. It revolves around God. We need to make ourselves very small and make our God very big. We owe Him everything. He's blessed us with the highest blessings and grace. It follows, then, that if you and I owe God everything that the only acceptable thing we can do is offer Him the highest level of service. I said earlier that Paul is writing to believers in Romans 12. He says, therefore, brothers, he's talking to believers like us. And it is only believers who can do this. It's only believers who can present their bodies as a living sacrifice. This is something only believers can do. Presenting their bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. It goes on in verse 2 to say, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. 
That is by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. What Paul is saying in verses 1 and 2 can only be done, can only be obeyed by true believers. Those who already belong to God's family. You can't give God an acceptable offering unless you have already first offered Him yourself, your very soul. That's the first step. You can't even get to the rest unless you've done that. The unregenerate person cannot give God his mind, his body, or his will because he has not given God his soul, himself. If he hasn't done that, there's no way he can do the rest. Because the unregenerate has no saving relationship to God, well, it's like 1 Corinthians 2.14 has told us, a natural man does not accept the things of God, for they are foolishness to him. And he cannot understand them. A natural man cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. Only the redeemed can present a living sacrifice to God because only the redeemed have spiritual life. Only the redeemed have the Holy Spirit living inside of them, able to make this even possible. And only believers are a type of spiritual priest who can come before God with an offering. I call you to remember Matthew 16, 26, when Jesus says, What will a man profit if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? The soul is the inner, invisible essence of your being. The core of you. Therefore, until a man's soul belongs to God, nothing else matters. There's no other spiritual significance. So he says in verse 2, Do not be conformed to this world, in Romans 12, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. When it says, do not be conformed, this is also a command to believers. Do not be conformed. It means do not follow. Be not be, don't be in a similar type. Don't be familiar with. And so do not be familiar with or do not follow what? This world. Do not be conformed to this world. Do not look or sound like a Christian on the outside only. I'll say that again. Do not look or sound like a Christian on the outside only when what is really inside is like the world. That's what he's saying. Believers, watch yourself. Don't be that Christian who only sounds and looks like a Christian on the outside. But if all that veneer was ripped away, the inside is full of the world. You would look just like if you took off all the fakeness that you're just like the world on the inside, but on the outside, it looks like you're a Christian. Saying, don't do that. Do not look or sound like a Christian on the outside only when inside really is like the world. Don't let your Christianity be an act. Don't let your Christianity be a masquerade. Let it be real. Don't be like the world. Do not be conformed to this world. It's better translated age. Do not be like this age, which refers to the system of the world, the beliefs of the world, or the spirit of the age, who is Satan. This world and the way that the world operates is under the control and influence of Satan. Don't be like the world. Because when you're like the world, you're like Satan, selfish, prideful. Wanting to be your own God. Wanting to be like God. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed like a metamorphosis. Be transformed. Don't be like the world, believers. Be transformed. You think of 2 Corinthians 5, 17. You are a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. 
Let your outward appearance match your inward appearance because you've been transformed. It's the same way that Matthew describes this word for transformed. It's the same type of word that's used for the transfiguration in Matthew 17. Just as Christ briefly and in a limited kind of way displayed outside his divine nature that was inside, that happened at the glory of the transfiguration. Christ's glory on the inside. He allowed that to be seen on the outside just for a brief moment. In the same way, believers are to outwardly show your inner holiness, your redeemed nature from the inside out. Not just once, but daily, all the time. So do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. To be transformed can only occur for the person who God has saved and who has the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. There are certain things you certainly cannot do unless God, in the form of the Holy Spirit, was within you and had regenerated you and made it possible for you to do these things. Only the Holy Spirit of God can change your thinking through His power and through the illumination of His Word. You find that through consistent study and meditation on Scripture that you begin to grow. It's Psalm 119. Your Word, God, is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. He guides us through His Word by His Holy Spirit, illuminating it for us which then renews your mind. Your renewed mind is now, instead of saturated with the things of the world, your mind begins to soak up and become more and more saturated with the things of God, with God's Word. And you begin to become more and more controlled by God's Word and God's Spirit. And as that happens, you are able to discern what God's will is. Because you're in His Word more. And you have the Holy Spirit illuminating His Word to you. And so now, whereas before you had no clue what God's will is, before you had no way of discerning what's good, what's acceptable, what's perfect, what does God want me to do, now for the regenerate person who's been saved and indwelt with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit has led you through the Scriptures, has tra is training you and teaching you and illuminating His Word in your mind now. Now you're able to identify and discern what God's will is according to His written, unchanging Word. And now you'll be able to tell what is good, what is acceptable, what is perfect in God's sight. You'll be able to live more and more and more a holy life in which God approves. A life that is morally and spiritually focused on Him. That's all part of that sanctification process. And it's all by God's grace that we're able to do this. But this is the bar. This is what we're supposed to be doing, Christians. Don't be like the world. Don't settle don't just say, well, this is what, I, I'm accepting this. This is what feels good to me, or I can rationalize this out. I can sleep at night when I think of this way. No, I'm, I'm, I'm breaking that mold for you. We don't get to decide what is the way we're supposed to live. God's word tells us. We have to abide by that if we call him Lord. So by his grace, we learn more of grace in verse 3. It says, for by the grace given to me, Paul says... For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, to all believers, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. Grace, which is being given divinely, which is what we do not deserve, Remember that grace is something that we don't deserve. Being given something you don't deserve. That's what God has poured out on Paul. God poured out on Paul grace that he did not deserve. 
and he poured out on Paul additional grace when he called Paul to be an apostle. That's what Paul means by, for by the grace given to me. That very first section of verse 3. That's what Paul means by that. That grace, undeserved grace, undeserved gifts have been poured out on Paul by God. God's grace also produces a sincere humility and sound judgment. When you read through verse 3 and you say, what is this saying here? What did God's Holy Spirit breathe out through the writing of Paul here? What does this mean? The very first part is talking about the grace that has been given to Paul, not only to be saved, but to be able to be called to be an apostle. And then he says, through that office that has been divinely given by God's grace, he says, everyone among you is not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. So in other words, God's grace also produces humility. It produces sound judgment. Do you see how humility works into the picture in the sense that if you're going to give your all to God, you must humble yourself to do it, right? If I'm not going to humble myself to God, well then, I'm going to say, well, I don't, you know, I'm grateful, God, but I don't want to give you everything. You must humble yourself to be able to give him everything. And so God's grace produces sincere humility and sound judgment. That's what that sober judgment is talking about. The exercise of sound judgment, which will lead believers to recognize that you yourself are nothing. I'm sorry to be the one to break that to you, but we are nothing. We are but dust. We are so far from the value of God. We're nothing. And when we think of ourselves correctly, when we put ourselves in our proper place, it brings about humility. Humility. Think of Job. Job thinks he's got a good argument against God. Right? God, I've only done what's right. Why are you doing this to me? And what does God do when Job starts to speak up to him? Who is this that darkens my counsel? Who speaks words without knowledge? And when God's done taking Job to the woodshed, Job does what? He puts his hand over his mouth. He has been humbled. He recognizes that he is but man. And God is God. When we recognize that we are depraved, when we recognize that we're sinful wretches, you recognize that God is holy and he's the only one who's holy, it puts us in our proper place and you will no longer fight him about when he says, I want this part of your life. It's mine. You won't fight him anymore. I just, you know, God can take what he wants. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the Lord. The more you recognize who God is and who you are, it will put you in your proper place. And you won't fight him. You will humbly obey. 1 Peter 5, verses 5 through 6 says this. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you. He's speaking to believers. Clothe yourselves, clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. When you recognize your true place in the universe, when you recognize that you're totally depraved, only saved by God's grace, and when you recognize that, guess what? You find it hard to talk about others in disparaging ways because you yourself are humble, knowing that, you, hey, you're only saved by God's grace, just like this person next to you. It says, For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. We must be humble. The more, the more knowledge you have of God's word, it shouldn't puff you up. The more knowledge you have of God's word, it should knock you down, humble you, break you. That's what knowledge of God's word does. It humbles you and breaks you, and it, and it pushes God up and drink, drags you down, drags you down to your proper place. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, 
so that at the proper time he may exalt you. It's like the story of the wedding feast. You don't want to sit at the front end of the table at the wedding feast because what if the wedding master comes and says, excuse me, you're in the wrong place. You are supposed to be sitting way back here at the end. How embarrassing. How humiliating. Right? Don't think so highly of yourself. Instead, go to the end of the table and then let the master of the ceremonies recognize you there and say, no, 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 you don't belong here. You belong up here. So in other words, humble yourselves. Think lowly of yourselves so that at the proper time, God himself may exalt you to the proper place. When we think this way, it sure is hard to be gossips. When we think this way, it sure is hard to speak poorly of others. We reprove, we correct, we, re we rebuke, we admonish, but we do in gentleness and love. And we do so not thinking of ourselves better than anyone else. Because we're all saved by God's gift of grace. Verse 3 again in Romans 12. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. What is that? What, what is the measure of faith that Paul is talking about there? He's talking about the, the correct proportion of the spiritual gift of faith. Not saving faith, okay? But rather the faithful use or stewardship of one's own particular gifts that come about by faith. So in other words, every believer receives exactly the gift and the resource that they need to fulfill God's portioned out plan for them in the body of Christ. To edify the body of Christ. God perfectly gives the exact right gifts and the exact right amount of this resource and that resource to everyone that's in his church for the purpose of building it up. So the correct proportion of the spiritual gift of faith. It's not saving faith. It's the faithful stewardship of your own particular gifts that God has given you. So each according. So I need to not be full of myself, but to think of myself more uh, humbly, with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has apportioned us or has assigned makes me think of 1 Corinthians 12, verses 7 through 11, which says, To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good, for the common good of the church. For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit, and to another faith by the same Spirit, and to another gifts of healing by one Spirit, to another the working of miracles, and another prophecy, and the other ability to distinguish between spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, and to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by the one and same Spirit, who apportions to each individually as he wills. Again, it's for the building up of the church. Faith is a gift, and God gives it to all those whom he has dragged to himself and who has called, he has called and elected to believe. And then once he has saved you and you're indwelt with the Holy Spirit, you are given spiritual gifts for the building up of the church. And so what Paul's saying is, is use those humbly. Be humble. Don't think so highly of yourself. Instead, focus on the building up of the church by using the gifts that God has given you in the amount that he has given them to you in. Everyone's been given different amounts, and it was God who decided how much and which ones. So don't think of yourself more highly. You've all been saved by grace. Don't think of yourself more highly because you have this gift or that gift, because it was God who chose who got what gift. Right? Right? We're focusing on these three verses today because these are so important. These are so important. So I ask you, we have to go through this kind of chronologically. Are you right with God? Are you right with God? 
How about this? Here's, here's another question that's even more piercing. Is Jesus Christ your Savior? Is He just your Savior? Or is He also your Lord? There's a difference. Are you trusting in Christ just to save you? That's taking something from God. Or are you not only taking and trusting in Him as your Savior, but are you also making Him your Lord? And by doing so, saying, I give myself to you. I surrender all. There's many people out there who call Jesus their Lord and Savior, but He is not, they're only relying on Him for salvation. He is not the Lord of their life. You peel back the veneer and the rest of their life looks just like the world. They're living for themselves. They're not living for God. They're not living for the life to come. They're living for their life here and now. So is Jesus just your Savior or is He your Lord? Daily, what's the answer to that question? Be asking yourself that. Is what you show on the outside match what you truly are on the inside? Are you saying one thing, but in truth, inside, you are friends with this age, friends with this world? Are you conformed to this world? It's James 4, verses 3 and 4, that says, When you ask, you do not receive, because you ask with wrong motives. He's talking about prayer at the beginning here. That you may squander it on your own pleasures. He's saying many of you have pray and don't receive what you're asking for. And the reason you don't receive it is because you're asking for the wrong reason. You're asking for your own self. It's for your own pleasures, your own reasons. It's not to glorify God. It's not for the edification of his church. You're just asking for your own selfish reasons. He goes on to say in verse 4, You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility towards God? The world hates God. Why would you ever want to be a friend with the world that hates God, the one who died for you, who's given you everything? Do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility towards God? Therefore, whoever chooses to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. There's a clear line drawn. We're ambassadors to this world as believers. You're not permanent residents. You're not a citizen of the world. You're a citizen of heaven when you're saved. There's a clear line. Do not give up your citizenship in heaven. John 15, verse 19 says, If you were of the world, it would love you as its own. You're not of this world, friends. Do not fool yourselves into thinking that you can be friends with it or that it will be kind to you. It won't. It hates your God. It hates your Lord. If you were of the world, it would love you as its own. Instead, the world hates you because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That's Jesus' own words. He's chosen you out of this world. Why are you trying to claw back into it and stay hanging on to it? You're supposed to be very different than the world. It should be very clear and easy to tell the difference between you and an unbeliever. Have you been transformed? Has God renewed your mind and changed the way that you think? Do you look at sin completely differently now? Is your mind, start, is your conscience starting to get pricked every time you're doing this or that? And it's like, ah, oh, I know I shouldn't be doing this. I'm going to start doing that, right? That's transformation. That's the power of God's Holy Spirit at work in His believers. Is that happening to you? Are your ways of thinking changing? Have you been saved and henceforth being saved? You're also indwelt by God's Holy Spirit. And when that happens, the Holy Spirit begins to illuminate His Word to you. You look back between this very moment and say six months ago, or even a year ago, or even three years ago, have you seen yourself growing in the knowledge of God's Word? He teaches you and illuminates His Word to you more and more, which then allows you to discern right from wrong, good and not good. Discern what His Word really says, what His will really is. Are you guilty of thinking more highly of yourself than you should? Or have you been humbled? And if you are, no doubt, if you're saved, you've been humbled. 
But I ask you, even if you've been humbled, are you humble still? Don't allow yourselves to get puffed up. Do you recognize your weakness, your sinfulness, your need and dependence completely and totally on God's grace? That need is every day. If you made a decision for Christ 20 years ago, and you think to yourself, when I ask those questions, do you recognize your weakness and your sinfulness? Well, I don't need to have to think about that anymore because I've already been saved. Wrong! Wrong! You need to think about that. Because we are constantly weak. We are constantly in need of God's grace. We're totally dependent upon Him. So we can't just be satisfied. That You must completely stay humble and recognize that this is true. You need Him completely and totally every moment of every day you're dependent upon God's grace. Not just before you were saved, but even after. You're still dependent upon God's grace. If you remember that and acknowledge your depravity, all I have to do is start asking enough questions. No, I don't, you know, that was me before. Oh, okay, so you don't sin anymore? Well, I didn't say that, but I'm not as bad as I used to be. Really? You're, you're, now you're better? Well, yeah, I'm better, but see, I mean, it just starts to get messy. No, you're still a sinner saved by grace and grace alone. And the holiness you have, the righteousness you lay claim to, is not even your own righteousness. It's Christ's righteousness. You need him every second of every day. And the more we recognize our own depravity, the more we recognize our dependence upon God's grace and how marvelous it is and how much easier is it to let go and humble ourselves and yield to God's will instead of our own when we think that way. Are we using the gift of faith and resources that God has given us to fulfill the role that he has portioned out for you? Everybody has a specific role that God has portioned out for you. Every single one. There's a mention of it in Ephesians 2 verse 10. That he's already got it set aside for you. Are you using the gifts that he's given you and the resources he's proportioned out to you to fulfill that? Do you even know your gifts? If you don't, let me help you. God's word will answer that question for you. Are you trying to get all you can from God? Or are you giving all that you are and all that you have to him? Use that litmus test that I described earlier about if God was right here in front of you, what would you be willing to give him? If you would give him anything different than what you give him when he's not right in front of you, you need to change. And you also need to remember that he is right in front of you. Believer, you're indwelt with the Holy Spirit. That's no less God than God the Father sitting on the throne and no less God than Jesus Christ sitting at his right hand. God is right inside you. He is right in front of you. So let's not try to get all we can from God. Let's try to give him all that we are and have. That way we can truly say, like Luke 9, 23, that we're denying ourselves, picking up our cross, and following him. That's what Christ says we need to do if we want to follow him. Or in Matt 6, 23, to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and then everything else will be added on to me. All this goes back to Matthew 22 where Jesus is asked, what is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replies, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. That's what we're talking about. And the second he says is this, this is the greatest and first commandment. And the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. See, the first part is tied in exactly with what we were talking about, giving our all to God, right? And the second part, when it was talking about grace in verse 3, talking about grace and humbling yourself and using the gifts that God has given you, well, that's just like the second commandment, loving your neighbor, loving others as you yourself would want to be loved, doing unto others as you yourself, you yourself would want done unto you. Those two greatest commandments are exactly what's being talked about here in Romans 12, verses 1 through 3. Next week, we'll look at Romans 12 again, and we'll see more marks of the true Christian. 
until then, let's pray. Father, you say in your word that no one can serve two masters because they'll either hate the one and love the other or they will be devoted to the one and despise the other. Lord, I fear that, that we allow too many things to come in and get in between us and you. I fear that we serve even more than two masters. I fear that even as believers, that it's so easy for us in this fallen world to be led astray and to end up having two, three, four, five, six, seven, twelve different things above you, ahead of you, in our time, in the use of our resources, in everything. Lord, I pray, let this not be so. Cleanse our hearts. Renew a right spirit in us. Forgive us of our sins. Forgive us for not loving you and praising you and worshiping and living for you as we should. We know that we could never do it perfectly this side of heaven. And we rejoice knowing that one day we can worship and live for you perfectly in heaven. But until then, Lord, let us not be content to live like the world. Help us to be different. Help us to stand out. Help us to live according to your word. Guide us by your Holy Spirit and give us the strength, the fortitude to persevere and to do what your word says. Illuminate our minds. Keep this word on the forefront of our hearts this week and every week moving forward so that we can be better ambassadors and more and more like Christ, our Savior and your Son, in whose name we pray. Amen. You know, I, I believe in God and that I said that by God's grace. Mm -hmm. And you had said I was partially right, partially wrong on, on, on that. Well, anybody who goes to heaven, anybody who goes to heaven is going to go to heaven because of God's grace. Like the five solas, it's by God's grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone, for the glory of God alone. Mm -hmm. And that's through scripture alone that we know that. And so it's not, it's, it's accurate to say that I'm going to heaven by God's grace, but you want to expound on that a little bit more okay. anytime that somebody asks. Yeah, because if I just say that, people will say, uh, okay, right? But they don't really know what I mean by that. Like, how was God's grace given to me? Oh, it was given to me by faith in Jesus Christ, who died for my sins and who I am trusting in for righteousness, and that's how I'm getting into heaven, by the propitiation of his sins. By, you know, by his stripes, I am spiritually healed. You know, just giving a little bit more so that they understand where that grace is coming from and, and what that means. Because to the average person, they have no idea what you mean. You know, they have no idea. They've got... Imagine like when you were first hearing about Christ and when he first started getting into God's word, you knew very little. And so, you know, as you've grown, you learn more. And we forget that the other people that we're talking to are, have no idea. They've never heard of the word grace, sanctification, justification, salvation, um, death, burial, resurrection of Christ, heaven, hell. They only have the ideas that have been kind of bled into them from society. So they might have... They might think that, you know, that, that, that horrible TV show, Supernatural, that that is what really what it's like. That's, that's what, you know, the Bible talks about is what you see in this show. Or they might watch a movie like that bad movie Constantine that talks about demons and stuff. And they might think, oh, that's what it's really like, right? So they get their information from everywhere but the Bible. So we have to remember that as believers and make sure that we talk to them on their level, but also using God's word and truth that we know to be able to explain, well, this is why I have the, the faith that I have. It's 1 Peter 3.15. Be prepared to give the reason for why you have a hope. So be able to describe the gospel. You know, yeah, I'm saved by God's grace, and this is what that means. So that would be the best way. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that would be something that, you know, think about those things. You're meant to be doing that. It's not just a pastor's job to share the gospel. It's every believer's job. Matthew 18 uh, or Matthew 28, uh, verses 18 through 20, is the Great Commission, and that's for all believers. So you want to be comfortable enough with the gospel that when somebody asks you, that you're able to present it. You don't have to go, okay, like, oh, hold on one second. You don't need to pull out a big briefcase and be like, let's go through this. <laughs> you, know, you don't need two hours to do it. You should be able to explain it relatively quickly with a little bit of, you know, with a little bit of understanding that they're going to 
you know, maybe not get it all. But then, you know, be able to tell them, like, I'd love to talk to you more about this, or I'd love to bring you to church sometime you could hear more about this, or I'd love to, you know, there's always those things. But we, we ourselves should be familiar with the gospel so that you're able to share it, but that you also have assurance yourself. If I don't know the gospel, how do I know I'm saved? Because it's the gospel that saves, Romans 1.16. So if I don't know the gospel, how do I know I'm even saved? I need to know the gospel. That's like numero uno. So if that's ever anything that is confusing to you, or you feel like you know it, but you feel like it would be nice to be able to put it into words a little more crisply or clearly, you know, that's stuff that, that, that's what I'm here for. You know, you can ask me and I'll be happy to help you. And we'll do a, uh, one of these, either a sermon or a Bible study, we're going to do the gospel. And we'll explain in great detail exactly what the gospel is. And I'll give you guys some examples to use and some tools to use in sharing it. That'll make you feel a little more confident and, and uh, help with that. So, Father, we have so much to be thankful for to you. We thank you for all the wonderful things that you're doing in the lives of those people who we just talked about. We also want to come to you, Lord, in humility and just ask for your forgiveness for all our sins, for all the times that we've failed you, which is many. And we know we will continue to fail you as you sanctify us. But we know one day, Lord, you will finish the good work that you've begun in us. And we look forward to that day. In the meantime, Lord, help us. Help us to be able to obey your word and to be more like Christ and less like ourselves. We're so grateful for the ability to pray to you and to know that by your sovereign and complete power that you're able to move in these situations with all wisdom and strength and that you'll do what's best for those people that we're about to pray for but also for your glory. Lord, all these things we lift up to you. We lift up ourselves as well. You know each and every one of our situations and where we are weak and need you the most. We pray that you will give us our daily bread each day of the week, that you'll lead us not into temptation, but that you will deliver us from evil and lead us in your righteousness and help us to abide in you and your word. It's in Jesus' name that we ask this and thank you. Amen. God bless you, each and every one of you. May his peace go with you. May his assurances and truth be brought to your remembrance as you need it each day this week. And God bless you.